All right, go ahead, Beth. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Glad to have you here uh, this afternoon for our State Archives Showcase of New Jersey and New York. Uh, what we will do is have speakers from the State Archives of New Jersey and New York uh, introduce you to their uh, archives. Um, you'll have time for asking some questions and uh, then Becky will wrap things up with a uh, discussion of upcoming webinars and some other events and announcements. Uh, and so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, what I'd like to do to begin with is introduce you to today's speakers uh, from the New Jersey State Archives first. Uh, we have Joseph Klett. Joe began researching at the State Archives in 1978 at age 14 after taking an interest in family history. He earned a BA from University of Pennsylvania in Russian language and literature, and he worked for the New Jersey State Archives during his summers as an undergrad. He earned an MLS from Rutgers University and worked as a graduate assistant in the University Archives at that time, and he joined the full-time staff at the State Archives in 1989 as a collections manager. He became chief of operations in 2000 uh, when he planned and oversaw relocation to a new facility. He became executive director in 2012. Uh, Joe has served on the board of the Genealogical Society of New Jersey since uh, he was age 23 while he was in grad school um, and has been editor of its newsletter and scholarly journal, the Genealogical Magazine of New Jersey. Uh, Joe's also volunteered for different local history organizations over the years and is currently president of the Hopewell Museum. Also from New Jersey State Archives, we have Veronica Calder. Uh, Ronnie has worked at the New Jersey State Archives since 2000 and joined full-time staff in 2003. She received her BA from the College of New Jersey and her MLS from Rutgers University. So we have two Rutgers grads here. Uh, she currently works as supervising archivist and oversees the reference, outreach, and data services units. And when she's not at work or Ubering her two sons to various sporting events, she loves to bake and she participates in triathlons. So Ronnie, Ronnie's got me exhausted even before she says a word here. <laughs> and, and then our third speaker um, has refused to provide us with a bio. So, uh, so that leaves it up to me, which, which is really not a wise decision. Um, so I, I will say um, some things and he can correct me later if he feels he needs to. Uh, Thomas J. Ruller is the Assistant Commissioner and State Archivist at the New York State Education Department. He took an interest in history as a teenager growing up in Gloversville, New York and connected with the New York State Archives at that time. Uh, Tom earned a BA in history and an MLS in information science from State University of New York at Albany. Uh, and he spent almost two years as an archivist at the Alabama Department of Archives and History uh, from 1986 to 1988 before returning to New York. Uh, worked as an archivist at the New York State Archives from 1988 to 1999 and then went over to the dark side for a time uh, until 2015, working as an IT manager and then as director of operations for New York, the New York Office of Cultural Education, which includes the State Archives and the State Library and the State Museum. Uh, he was appointed assistant commissioner and state archivist in 2015. Uh, and since then, he has had a string of uh, achievements, including serving as president of COSA and starring in a short film, introducing people to the New York State Archives and urging them in no uncertain terms to prepare appropriately before coming to the archives for research. Um, so, um, so we will get started now with our speakers uh, from New Jersey, New Jersey State Archives, uh, beginning with Joe Klett. Hello, everyone. Tom, we might have to, to hire you to do a video like that for us, <clears throat> how to prepare before you come in. So um, uh, thank you for that introduction, uh, Beth, very much. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, organizational structure and sort of backstory of the archives. So if you want to advance to our first slide, um, our statutory mission is probably very similar to most other state archives. Um, it, the um, 
I think the big difference between state archives across the country is uh, sort of the starting date of the records that we all take care of. And so, of course, the oldest records in the country are in the state archives of the 13 original states. And, uh, and so uh, our records uh, start <laughs> generally in 1664 when New Jersey was created as a British province. Um, you can go ahead and I, I'll, I, I don't think I need to read this. It's basically the preservation of the of the government records. And um, I will mention, though, that uh, in 2012, re our records management function was separated out from the state archives and, and placed under the oversight of the Department of Treasury, which um, was not expected and created quite a lot of challenges for several years. Things are fairly smoothly running now, but it still is the case that records management is under the Department of Treasury, whereas uh, the State Archives is under the Secretary of State's office. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide. So we're located at 225 West State Street, which is right in downtown uh, <coughs> uh, Trenton, uh, really just uh, a stone's throw or half a block anyway um, from the State House, which is currently under re renovation. Uh, our building was built in 1964 uh, as the uh, quarters of the uh, New Jersey Department of Education. Um, ironically, it's where my dad worked. Uh, he was the personnel director for Department of Education. So I'm in, I ended up back in the same building, not on the same floor, but in the same building that my dad worked in. Um, uh, we uh, were supposed to move out of the state library five years after we were separated organizationally uh, from them in 1983. So by 1988, we were supposed to move out of the State Library building. Uh, 17 years later, we did move into this building. It takes a little while. If you work in state government, you know it takes some time to get some things done. And uh, so we moved into this facility in the year 2000 from the State Library. It was not the ideal new construction that we would have loved to have, but it was an existing building in downtown Trenton, right next to the State Library, the museum, the State House, all of the other primary government agencies that we have um, sort of a symbiosis with. And, um, uh, and so it was going to give us twice the storage capacity of our quarters in the State Library, wasn't going to give us 20 years of growth uh, for our collections, but we felt that it was advantageous enough that we agreed that we would move here. So they had to kind of retrofit an office building to hold high density storage, which is actually all on the lower level. So it's on the ground floor. Um, but that is our space, which the governor's office moved into in 2015, I think was the year uh, while Governor Christie was still in office. Uh, they threatened to move the state archives out. The public protested. They decided, all right, well, we'll leave the archives in there. But so we, we share the building with the office of the governor currently. And, uh, and the state treasurer's office. And we didn't include our sign, but the sign when it was re replaced had the governor's office in ginormous letters, the treasurer's office in medium letters and state archives in tiny little letters on the bottom, but that we occupy about half of this building between our collections and our public spaces. Um, so you can advance to the next slide. So our history goes back to uh, the provincial secretary's office uh, and the clerk of the Supreme Court, which go, you know, go to the 1600s uh, when our records start. Uh, New Jersey's public record office was created in 1920, and that was sort of the first formal state archives function. So about 100 years ago, plus a couple of years. Uh, in the 1940s, uh, the public record office was absorbed into the state library and called the Bureau of Archives and History. And so for 40 years, that's what the state archives was known as. Uh, in 1983, by a re reorganization plan by Governor Kane in New Jersey, um, uh, we were created as the Division of Archives and Records Management within the Department of State. And as I mentioned before, in 2012, uh, by uh, Memorandum of Understanding between the Departments of State and Treasury. Uh, our records management function is uh, is currently overseen by the Division of Revenue and Enterprise Services in the Department of the Treasury. You can go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> so on the left, you see our um, uh, manuscript reading room. I don't think there are any patrons in there at that point. Uh, and on the right, you see 
one wing of our uh, sort of L-shaped um, uh, microfilm reading area. Um, this uh, is the 2000 renovation of a pre-existing office building, but it really uh, was a quantum leap for us in terms of public facilities, both in terms of um, uh, collection storage and uh, public amenities for researchers. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. Uh, on the left is what we call our courtyard space. It's intensive processing areas uh, with uh, workstations around that um, uh, for the hands-on cataloging, arrangement, description work, uh, data, data work, uh, scanning work that's, that's done on, uh, by our collections management staff. And on the right, you see uh, the smaller storage area that's uh, up on the second floor where our research areas are. We call that our high reference storage area. That's just uh, about 3% of the manuscript collections that are in the building. You can go ahead to the next slide. And then on the left here is um, uh, looking through two, I think that's two um, of the quadrants of mobile shelving in our, um, in our main stack area. We hold about 40,000 cubic feet of records in the building. We have another 10 or 12 in storage offsite at the State Records Center, which used to be under our management, but that's currently under Treasury, but we have uh, records still in storage as our annex outside of Trenton, um, about uh, 30,000 reels of microfilm. And on the right-hand side, you see our, the safe in our vault uh, where uh, the Bill of Rights and the ratification and some of the early charter documents are kept. You can go ahead to the next slide. So um, uh, I'm gonna talk just very briefly about collection management electronic records. And then Veronica, Ronnie Calder is going to talk about um, her Bailiwick, which is Reference Outreach and Data Services. So uh, New Jersey just started its electronic records program. Uh, <clears throat> it takes about 30 years to get some things done in government, apparently, because uh, my former director, Carl Nieder, and I uh, have been trying to get this done for, for that long. Um, of course, uh, in more recent years, uh, when it started to get uh, a little bit farther along and, and uh, we were able to talk to uh, actual people that could make things happen about how we wanted to see this done. The plan of course was to um, get a, a digital archivist in place at the senior level, hire a junior archivist, select the platform that we want and, and then bring in the digital assets. In state government, things tend to work uh, backwards. I'll, I won't use the expression that came to mind um, but uh, we had these digital assets. They offered money, uh, money for us to get the platform, which we decided to do uh, with Preservica, uh, knowing that we had the support through COSA and other state archives. Then they gave us the junior archivist. And then just last week, we hired the senior archivist. So literally upside down from what we wanted to do. But we got here and, and uh, of course, uh, chose not to say no at any point along the way, although we have been holding off on accession and digital assets, assets from outside of the state archives, but we've produced tens of thousands of our own by this point. Um, so the electronic records program, uh, we're very excited. Our junior archivist attended the best practices exchange and, and uh, uh, last month, and um, we just hired, uh, uh, are in the process of hiring, so I can't mention the name, but we're, but we're happy with uh, where this has uh, brought us to in terms of our electric electronic records program and now the fun really starts. In terms of collection management, and, and I wanted to just briefly say, the organization within the state archives, um, which is a division of state government in the uh, Sec Secretary of State's uh, Department of State, um, the division within the, uh, the, the breakdown of the structure within the state archives has evolved depending on who we had and what their uh, capabilities were. So when I started in 1989 full-time, uh, what was called Processing and Publications was the unit and Reference was the other unit. When they hired me, I became collection manager and so collection management was set off as its own unit. And then eventually publications uh, kind of became website and outreach and uh, data services. So right now we have uh, this 
the structure and three of the functions um, come under Ronnie uh, as a supervising archivist. And relative to collection management, uh, we have one full-time archivist and, se and several uh, uh, part-time uh, assistants and then other archivists do different jobs that would be related to collection management and we're hiring another collection management archivist too. Right now we have 10 full-time staff members, six part-time staff. We just hired the senior electronic uh, uh, records archivist that will bring us to 17. And <clears throat> then I have three more vacancies. We lost a good number of people through retirement or resignation um, of part-time staff during uh, the pandemic. And only just now are we finally able to fill some, some positions. So um, we should have a complement of 20 on staff, uh, I'm hoping by the end of this year so, or soon into the next year. Um, so that takes care of collection management, electronic records in a, in a broad sense. Um, we don't have an in-house preservation, uh, conservation lab, we contract out generally uh, with the Conservation Center in, in Philadelphia, CCAHA. Um, uh, so collection management means, you know, archival review or appraisal, the accessioning process and arrangement description. And building databases uh, is actually, uh, comes under data services. So um, I'll hand off to Veronica Calder to talk about uh, her, her purviews. Okay, so uh, oh, um, so the just to touch upon the reference and outreach and data uh, data services unit. Thanks. Um, it's basically public facing anything that's public facing. So reference, um, you know, we a lot of the public that come in they use our collections on the microfilm room. We have a microfilm room in the manuscript, as you saw. Um, so we also fill orders online. Uh, we do go out and give presentations. Uh, highlighting the collections to a lot of a lot of mostly genealogical societies but some other organizations as well um, the data services is included in here because we feel that uh, the databases that are on the website that help people access our collections order the records from us um, everything kind of goes hand in hand um, all three unit well the collection management and reference outreach and data services unit all all work together um, we, if one doesn't do their job, then then it kind of holds up the other. So we all we all work together to to get the public the information they need and uh, the documents that they would like to research. And the reference function is de dependent on uh, the archivists and the other units, especially collection management, to help with uh, in person reference duty. Um, yeah, we have micro in the microfilm and the manuscript. Now at this point, we have appointments. Um, so yeah, we're all, we all kind of pitch in to, uh, to handle those, those blocks of time, um, whether it be microfilm or manuscript appointment. And that's, um, <clears throat> that was something obviously that we had to institute as we were opening back up after COVID, uh, but because of the number of positions that were vacated during that time, <clears throat> we, we could not have maintained <clears throat> five day a week services to walk-ins uh, with um, the, the, the smaller staff that we ended up with at the end of the pandemic. So as we build back up to fill vacancies, uh, we will at some point open back up to a normal level of, um, of service that's not by appointment, but for the time being, also because the governor instituted a, an alternate work week and telework program for a year, um, a couple of months ago. So um, we literally, I don't necessarily have everyone in the office uh, five days a week right now. And so we're, we're not sure how that is going to work with our public services going forward. Back to you, Ronnie, sorry. No, I, I'm fine with it. Um, you can go to the next slide. So a lot of the, the researchers that come in are looking for genealogical records. Um, probably, I, I would say about 75%. Um, whether it be they come in for an appointment and they're looking at marriage, uh, birth, marriage, or death records, land records, uh, wills, uh, naturalizations, things like that. Um, that, like I said before, they also have um, the online component, so they're ordering records online. Uh, we have, at any point, about a thousand orders waiting to be filled, um, and we're we're chipping away with it. That that back up 
happened when the pandemic hit. So we're still trying to chip away at that, but we've gotten more online orders than ever before. Uh, we also offer certifications of records um, to people and they use those for, you know, a lot of them use them for dual citizenship. Um, a lot of New Jerseyans apply for Italian uh, dual citizenship. Uh, so that's basically, uh, like I said, a lot of the people that come in, that, that's a lot of the reason why they're here. But like we do get other researchers, but the majority are genealogical. We should mention, uh, and I meant to do this before uh, when I was describing our collections, they start in 1664, but during the colonial period and early, and state, early statehood, a lot of records of highly, um, that are highly genealogically valuable, like marriage records and probate records, uh, deeds and, and other types of uh, records were filed centrally in New Jersey in the Secretary of State's office. Um, and we also were the repository for all the Mormon microfilming uh, by the Genealogical Society of Utah at Family Search today. Um, that was done in New Jersey. So uh, all the county deeds and county probate records too are here uh, on film. And so, and then we were also the host of the New Jersey Newspaper Project and did the filming. So we have all of the local uh, newspapers available on film here too. So there's a lot of one-stop shopping that can be done for genealogy at New Jersey State Archives, which may not necessarily be typical in other state archives, even our neighboring uh, states, Pennsylvania and New York, you have to go to the county courthouse to get a lot of the things that were filed centrally in New Jersey. You can go to the next slide. So this, um, this that's a screenshot of our searchable databases and records request forms. This is where a researcher would come to either um, search the databases and find a citation for a record or to, uh, if they, if our databases don't cover the time frame they want, then they can fill out a form online that, and we'll search for the record. There is a $10 fee is usually um, what the charge is. Um, they can pay by credit card or they can print it out and send it in uh, through the mail. We still do get people who mail us in checks. Um, so, but the records, you know, run the gamut of, you know, vital statistics, um, Supreme Court case files, uh, some military records like Revolutionary War damages, Civil War service records, um, some World War I. And there are, um, there is a, some photograph databases. I know agriculture, uh, the WPA uh, project that was in New Jersey and um, National Guard uh, photo collections are searchable databases at this point. Um, Even records like the Supreme Court case files are, are valuable genealogically because they start in 1702. So if there are bastardy or witchcraft trials, uh, you know, they're, they're in the New Jersey Supreme Court. It's not an appeals court as it is today. So yeah, that's, that's a huge genealogical resource. We're currently adding um, digital images to some of these databases, like the um, early land records database and the Supreme Court database. Um, a lot of a lot of times we find that people are requesting the same records, whether it's a slavery case or not, or, or something along those lines. So uh, we are going, we are slowly adding on uh, the digital copies. So it's more accessible to the public. And actually just today we uh, appended the marriage records database uh, up to 1900. That was, uh, it's about 500,000 records in that database right now. And that was a, a, one of the big data entry projects we did while the staff were working from home during COVID. Okay, next slide. So we're gonna go into some of the projects that we have ongoing right now here at the New Jersey State Archives. Um, currently, we have about 120 boxes of tax rateable lists. Um, Joe might be able to better describe this, but um, basically it's a, a record of those people paying taxes in New Jersey. It can be- um, Mostly not, property. What's that? Mostly real property. Real property, yeah. So not, not, but it's not just you know the people that own the land. It's also the the leaseholders. A lot of times you'll find women on the list who owned property, uh, single men, uh, householders. Sometimes there's a there's a column sometimes for slaves uh, that were owned. Um, a lot of times people use this 
genealogically because censuses, uh, federal censuses from New Jersey from 1790 to 1820 were burned in a fire. So they do not exist. So a lot of people use this information to prove that their ancestor was living in New Jersey during the time frame. They are organized uh, by county and then by township and then time period. But typically from they are from 1773 to around 1822 with a higher um, quantity from I would say what the 17 or 1800 yeah yeah or late 1700s early 1800s so um, currently we're scanning these um, I would say the the staff members scan them is about three quarters of the way through uh, scanning them making them digital and then uh, and then they're doing data entry uh, into a database that'll be available on our website okay next slide. Another, uh, another two projects are the Revolutionary War Service Card and World War I Service Card projects. So the Rev War Service Card, were, this was started because the 250th is, uh, anniversary of the United States is coming up. So we thought this would be a good um, project to highlight the Revolutionary War soldiers that were involved in the conflict. Um, the World War I cards, uh, those are the only service cards that exist for New Jersey for World War I. Um, the original records and the master negatives were destroyed. All we have left are is a service microfilm copy. Um, and even at that, some of the images are blurry or they can't be seen uh, very well. Uh, so we're slowly, uh, we're about, I think we're scanned through the letter P right now. Um, this started when the World War I centennial uh, happened. Uh, in 2018, we started the project. Um, and and these records are, are in addition to what the federal government holds, but in terms of the New Jersey right. Department of Military and Veterans Affairs holdings, this is one of the most important series that they have for World War I. And unfortunately, they destroyed the originals after they filmed these in 1950 something. So uh, it also uh, correlates with, we have another database online that's uh, soldiers from New Jersey who died in World War I. Uh, that collection includes correspondence and photos of soldiers. Um, so hopefully we can um, marry the two together to get a more complete picture of who from New Jersey served in World War I. Next. So the last project that we'll talk about is uh, New Jersey Early Land Records Project. Um, New Jersey has an interesting history in that its proprietors the original grantees of the land between the Hudson and Delaware rivers, um, their successors, um, which were boards of proprietors, held the records of New Jersey's earliest land transactions and their proprietary shares and the transactions that came out of those up until fairly recently. In 1998, the, uh, the records of the East Jersey proprietors, uh, believe it or not, New Jersey, the province of New Jersey was two different colonies. East Jersey's records came to us in 1998 and West Jersey's records came to us in 2005. That photograph of me at the beginning of the presentation uh, holding a box is, is literally when we were unpacking records from the 1600s that had come to uh, New Jersey State Archives in 2005 after being privately held essentially for, for uh, 300 years almost, um, over 300 years rather. Um, and so, uh, the land title folks in New Jersey and the Genealogical Society and the land surveying folks all wanted to see all of these uh, new resources indexed and digitized and uh, gave us seed money and we got a federal NHPRC grant altogether over $200,000 of grants and private donations um, to, uh, to index about 80,000 documents and digitize a large number of them, 15,000 was the initial goal. So you can uh, go ahead to the next, um, these are the, the, the there are different components um, of the project that are mostly completed now, but we still the project is still ongoing. And the Genealogical Society of New Jersey it was our fiscal partner, and uh, it's all, the work was all done and is being done under our supervision. Uh, but that's a, a little screenshot of the Genealogical Society's um, website about the project. You can go ahead to the next slide. And this is just some of the work underway, data entry, and we there was a big processing component for some of the loose papers of the West Jersey proprietors. We go to the next next page, and this is an example. This is all being fed into an existing database that uh, we have at the State Archives website, and then we uh, you can see 
on the left hand side is a search um, under an, a, a name and uh, either you can select it, the column on the left and order the record, or if we uh, actually attach the PDF of the file, you can just view the PDF and see the image right on, uh, on your screen at home. And so that on the right is an example of a survey uh, that has been digitized and attached to our database. So I think that's the last slide, but I'm not sure. No, there's another. Oh, there's one on conservation. Yeah, and so some of the money also has actually gone to um, uh, conservation work for very specific uh, selected documents. The one, uh, this one shown here is um, the uh, deed from Dame Elizabeth Carteret, the widow and successor to half of New Jersey, uh, widow of Sir George Carteret. New Jersey was named after the Isle of Jersey and Sir George Carteret was the bailiff or governor there. And so on the left is sort of the before conservation uh, shot and then on the right, it's in a case. Uh, the woman posing with it, her name was Elizabeth Parchment and she was a public information officer from Secretary of State's office. I made her pose with the Elizabeth Parchment. So Dame Elizabeth Parchment. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, the, the document after it was conserved uh, on display. You can go to the next slide. And then this one here uh, on the left, that's the Indian deed for all of present day Gloucester County, New Jersey in 1677. And it's extremely rare to find uh, an original with the Indians uh, seals and uh, marks, uh, which this one had. And um, it was folded up it's a tiny little size uh, in the box of records that we were unpacking from the 1670s. And on the right hand side, it's just to illustrate some of the exquisite detail that's included in these surveys that we're digitizing and indexing and uh, drawings of Joshua Cozen's house in 1799. And the other one that's there shows the, the family burial ground and the Quaker meeting is just up the road and that kind of thing. So, you know, the, the genealogists and the land land folks, the land title folks are, are just really happy and they keep offering us to, to, to fund this uh, more. So we keep finding more work that we can do. I think that's the last line. <laughs> Halloween theme there. Well, I guess then that turns it over to me. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Tom Ruller, uh, the State Archivist of New York. And uh, we can move on to the next slide, Ronnie. That was a good, not Ronnie, uh, Becky. Um, this, the New York State Archives is located in downtown Albany in the Cultural Education Center. This is a photo of that building. Uh, our archival collection is stored up at the very top in that big stripe of solid marble at the very top. That's where our collection is. We share this building with the State Museum, which has its exhibit spaces, as well as much of its collection, um, which is down on the third floor when the exhibits are on the first floor, and the State Research Library. New York is somewhat unique among other, among states in our state library, which has existed since 1818, uh, serves as a research library, started off similar to the Library of Congress as a library for the state legislature. So it's got an incredibly rich and long collection, um, which is available for, for on-site research primarily. Um, they also have their collection and their public spaces here. And then once I, once again, the State Archives has its offices and some, uh, most of our collections and collection processing spaces up on the 11th floor of this building in downtown Albany, the Cultural Education Center. We can move on. So the State Archives in New York is one of the newest state archives in the country. We were established in 1971. Uh, 70 years after the first state archives in the country was established, which was the Alabama State Archives, uh, established in 1971 as a component of the State Education Department, which means that we are governed not by the governor or the secretary of state. We are governed by the Board of Regents. Uh, the Board of Regents in New York oversees all educational and knowledge preservation and creation institutions in New York, including the State Museum, the State Library, and all libraries, and all museums, and all archives, and all schools, and all colleges and universities. Uh, the Board of Regents is really a unique entity uh, among any kind of, a, of an organization across the, the 50 states um, in that the Board of Regents almost is the fourth branch of government. It's independent, uh, at least designed to be independent of the political sphere uh, to protect the integrity of knowledge and learning. The first state archivist, Ed Weldon, was appointed in 1973 and our archival facility 
in the Cultural Education Center, which I just showed you, was opened in 1978. In 1987 and in 1988, there was a major program expansion with, where we took on records management for state agencies and for local governments across the state, as well as developing a program of technical services, grants, and supports for non-government historical records repositories. So those thousands of institutions across the state that collect the private papers, et cetera. The local history room in your local public library is a good example of those kinds of institutions. But that major program expansion it really exploded the role and responsibility and scope of the state archives. And those responsibilities continue with us today. We can move on, Becky. So to do all that work, we have three major components, and I'll talk about each one of these components separately. We have the Government Records Services Division, we have which was responsible for records management and services to local governments and state agencies. We have the Archival Services Division, which is, oversees our collections um, and also provides supports to those non-government repositories across the state. Um, and the Archives Partnership Trust, which is a unique entity that provides support, outreach, uh, and educational services uh, to the state archives and to the broader constituents uh, across New York State. We have 75 full-time staff uh, in lots of different capacities. We run the Record Center. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but we also, again, run the State Archives. So it's a pretty 50-50 mix of professional archivists and records managers and conservators and support staff that enable us to do our, our work. We have a $14 million annual budget, which includes a grant program for local governments. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And as I said, our primary facility is in downtown Albany. But because our collection is so large, uh, we have collections stored in some offsite areas uh, in Albany. Uh, everything is in Albany somewhere. Uh, but our primary facility in downtown Albany had a major renovation in 2004. So that top floor, that 11th floor of the Cultural Education Center, the building I showed you, uh, was built and, and designed in 2004. It was opened in 1976 in 2004 to provide a state-of-the-art archival storage facility where we have separate air handling systems, a wonderful move, movable shelving system, very tight physical security for those collection spaces. So to get into the stacks, to get into where we store our the records, uh, it's two-factor authentication to get into the security system. It's a constant 57 or 58 degrees and a constant relative humidity of 40%. So it's a really wonderful facility for the storage of the state's historical records. That's also where we have our public research room. I'll talk uh, quite a bit about how we provide public access, but our public research room is open from 9.30 in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon, five days a week. We shut down for a little bit during the pandemic. Uh, we were closed for almost uh, 14 months, uh, but since we reopened in May of 2021, we've pretty much been under, I don't wanna say normal operations, but uh, very similar to normal operations. Okay, Becky. So I want to talk about the archival services uh, division. Uh, th what do they do? Um, obviously, they administer the archival records of the state. I'll talk about what some of those records are. Um, but our collections focus really on state government or state or colonial government records. Uh, so we have very limited responsibility for private or local government records. We can accept them, but we almost rarely do. Uh, we really don't take private records. They're way outside of the scope of what our statutory responsibility is. Uh, local government records, we do have some on microfilm, and those are microfilm projects that resulted in copies of local government records. We might take some as an archive of last resort, but because New York has such a rich array of repositories across the state, and we have this very robust local government records management and our preservation program across the state, we really don't have much responsibility or much need for us to step in and do any work with local government records in terms of preservation and access. Um, we might take some private records if they're the records of a private individual who served in an important role in state government. So we have some of those very, very limited examples. 
we have 33 miles of records at the State Archives in New York. Uh, those records date from 1630 to the modern era. Uh, we have approximately 10 terabytes of digital records in our Preservica repository that we make available. Our electronic records program really dates back uh, to 1986. Uh, when we established something called the Special Media Records Project to start off with an initial inventory of electronic records across state government. We made our first accessions of digital records. Now, these aren't scanned files. These are born digital databases and other things that were transferred to the state archives in the early 1990s. And we continue to acquire digital records or born digital records, electronic mail, databases, et cetera, to, to this day. It remains a challenge for us, as it does for almost every other state archives, to convince records creators that digital files are records and digital files of archival records can be preserved in the state archives. Uh, but that's a great challenge for us to continue to face, and we're excited about it. And our Preservica repository, building on the legacy of the work that we've been doing for uh, over 30 years now. Um, has really given us the ability to do that in a very robust, disciplined, and organized way. We have extensive online resources for the discovery of the records that we have in the State Archives, including those digital records. Uh, I can point to our uh, role as an early implementer of digital access tools. Uh, the host of, of this program, Beth Golding, was one of the folks at the State Archives in New York that helped build that very robust digital interface to discover what records we have in the archives. And I can tell you that every single record series in our collection, including the ones that came in a month ago, has at minimum a scope and content note and is available and discoverable in our online systems, which consists of uh, an online OPAC or li typical library catalog as well as an EAD finding aid system. I'll talk a, quite a bit about that in, in a couple of minutes. And then, of course, the Archival Services Division has responsibility for support of over 2,000 repositories statewide. Um, and I'll talk very briefly about that. Becky. So in our collection, we have the things that every other state archives has. We have the constitutions of New York. This is the uh, cu first couple of pages of the 1777 constitution, which was uh, written and adopted in Kingston, New York, about two months before the British burnt Kingston down, uh, principally authored by John Jay. But there were subsequent constitutions in New York. Our current constitution was adopted in 1894, um, and all the amendments eventually find their way over to the state archives. Go ahead, Becky. As I mentioned, we have records dating back to 1630. Uh, the Dutch administered the New Netherland colony, um, which was based out of Manhattan, uh, what's called Manhattan or New Amsterdam. Um, so we have 13,000 or so individual documents from the New Netherland colony's administration. There's a deed signed by Peter Stuyvesant as an example. This was a wonderful project for us in that we were able to digitize and provide at least a description of the in English of each of these individual documents. All of them are discoverable uh, through our online finding aid system, and all of them are accessible as digital files in our digital management system. And finally, whenever we have available to us an English language translation for any of these documents, we make that available and it too is searchable. So item level access to this pretty rich collection of what has in the past been a very difficult to use and difficult to access, but very, very rich collection of records. Becky. We have records of all the big things that New York State has done, such as the construction of the Erie Canal in 1817. We're still in the middle of the bicentennial uh, of the construction and opening of the Erie Canal, which had an impact not just on New York, but really the nation um, in terms of changes in the financial infrastructure, changes in commerce, and changes in settlement patterns. Uh, those records include the original records from the construction of the canal in 1817. This is not a photo from 1817. I know many people wonder, well, how did they manage to do that? Now, this is a photo from the 1918 construction of the enlargement. Actually, they were working on it in 1909, uh, the construction of the enlargement of the current Erie Canal. But we have 
that whole continuum of records within the state archives. So anything the state has done in terms of construction, in terms of building roads or bridges, et cetera, those are the kinds of records that show up in the state archives. And this is one of our very heavily used and very interesting set of records that uh, get a, a lot of, of activity and a lot of use. Okay, we can go. Next. Tom, I'm just giving you a quick time check at 3.45. Yes, thank you very much, Beth. I'll try to wrap this up in about seven minutes. Um, I'll be like the guy in the copier commercial. Uh, again, in, uh, in addition to those records that we have uh, relating to the Erie Canal and all the other things, like other, other state archives, we have the court records of New York. Uh, New York's courts were centralized to a large extent between 1690 and 1847. So all of those court records from across the state, uh, judgments, court equity courts, law courts, et cetera, all of those are at the state archives. These records are, it's about 10,000 cubic feet of material. They're not the easiest things in the world to use if you don't know how to use them. And one of the things that we're about to wrap up soon is a published guide, an update to a published guide uh, about how to access and use uh, these incredibly rich and valuable resources. Many of you might have seen uh, a lot of the press that we recently received about a, num a case that Sojourner Truth brought in order to release her son from illegal bondage in uh, the southern states uh, that was done in the 1820s. That all happened in the New York state courts, and it's a great example of the rich stories that are available in these court records, which we hope will get more and more use. Becky, can we move on? So how do you get access to all of these things? Two big areas are, again, we've got a long legacy that is almost 40 years old now in terms of providing online access to the records in the state archives. Um, digital, our website is the gateway to everything that we do. Um, our digital collections, I'll talk about that in a second, but our the research tab of our website is where you go to discover what's in the state archives. Becky. So go to the research tab, uh, finding records in the archives, searching for records. We organize things based on a topic to make it easier for people to discover records that connect to one another that might not necessarily be automatically or intellectually connected uh, by the researcher. Finding aids. I'll show you a little bit of what our finding aid system looks like and how it works. We continue to maintain uh, an online public access catalog, which we share with the state library, uh, which also has the big state documents collection. Uh, so it's one great way of connecting published materials by government rec government repositories or government institutions and the organic archival records that those institutions create. Our online digital collections, we've built a number of, or we got a big name index of names that are across all kinds of records that we have. We have an enormous collection of motion picture film scripts, uh, which is also entirely searchable. We have the largest collection of film scripts in the world uh, with about 45 or 50,000 individual film scripts. All of that is available cert and searchable on our website. We can move on, please. So here's an example of one of our finding aids. Um, it's uh, again, this is all generated now uh, from our archive space uh, database. We use, uh, for those of you that are in the know about all this stuff, we use XTF as the presentation layer uh, so that researchers can search those finding aids and have a very easy and simple public access interface. Um, Again, we collect records from all over state government, like this one, uh, the New York State Wildlife Management Bureau, uh, Wildlife Management Reports, which is a great resource for understanding uh, biodiversity uh, and the evolution of, uh, well, the evolution of human impact on uh, the wildlife population of our state. Becky, because we're doing a whole lot of work, these are the, the container level lists uh, for um, that same set of records. For many of our record series, we can go down to the individual box level, um, and it's a, it's a great resource. In some cases, we can go down to the individual folder level, particularly things like governor's records. Uh, because so much of our access now is done over the internet, and we get, we get about six, 650 to 700 electronic mail messages uh, requests every month uh, that we respond to, Having these kinds of online detailed access tools greatly facilitates researcher remote researcher access and enables us to satisfy researcher requests that much faster and easier. 
Becky. Our digital collections, we have maybe 150, 200,000 digital images within our uh, online collection. We're scanning constantly. Some are organized into individual series, um, you know, all of the wills, all of the judgment roles of some particular court. Um, uh, lots of photographs are in that collection. Again, that's all searchable. For those of you that care, we use a product called Collective Access, which delivers uh, this digital content. Becky. We have had a long-standing relationship with Ancestry.com. Um, Ancestry has digitized millions of our genealogical records. This is a abbreviated list of some of the things that we've made available through Ancestry. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Becky, this is the kind of use that we get. You can see that during the past 12 months, uh, there have been over 10 million page views of just the materials that the New York State Archives has made available on Ancestry. We've got a very important and good deal with them where anybody from New York State gets free access to the records that the New York State Archives delivers. Um, we provide a little video on our website to teach people how to make sure they stay on the free side of Ancestry and don't get uh, stuck with having to pay to have access to their records, which we have made available. Becky. And then last but not least on the archival services program side, uh, we provide a lot of services, training and a small grant program to non-government records repositories across the state through our Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York program or DIPSNY. Um, it's been incredibly successful. We're now in our eighth year of delivering these resources. It's had tremendous impact on repositories across the state. Becky. I'm going to give short shrift to my colleagues in our government record services program, which is not good because uh, this is a in critical part of our archival program. Without the government record services and the work that they do, we wouldn't have a state archives. Local governments wouldn't know what records they need to keep and preserve. And we wouldn't have the ability to provide financial resources to those local governments to help them do their work. So that's what these folks in the government record services program do, training and technical assistance. They do records retention and disposition authority, and they provide grants to local governments across the state. Becky. So disposition scheduling, we have a number of general schedules, state agency general schedule, local government elections, and then lots and lots and lots of agency specific retention schedules. That's one of our statutory responsibilities that we acquired in 1987. We do an enormous number of webinars. We do a couple webinars a month, um, and those webinars are mm, probably seven or 8,000 participants uh, across the state. Um, it's a wonderful way to deliver content training to local governments uh, and state agencies, but local governments especially. Um, we really ramped that up uh, as we move forward uh, through the pandemic. Go ahead, Becky. Uh, again, there are 2,500 2, units of local government across the state um, that we serve all of them. And then there are 100 state agencies and public authorities that we serve. Okay. Retention and disposition schedules. This is our big consolidated schedule for local governments. It's available online um, and searchable online. We also produce a print version for people like me who prefer to have a piece of paper rather than do it online. Go ahead. Uh, again, this is just a list of the kinds of retention and disposition schedules that we produce. We've got a staff of about a dozen folks working over in that area of the, the program. Go ahead. Uh, Lots, all of our webinars and training are recorded like this one will be, uh, and people are able to watch them. We get a lot of traffic. Look at this one, uh, 42 videos, 1400 views um, in, in our records management section. Go ahead. And we operate the State Records Center. Um, we have about 300,000 boxes of inactive records that we store at the State Records Center. Um, we provide those services to state agencies. They pay us an annual fee of $2.90 a box um, with unlimited retrievals, et cetera. It's a safe, secure way of ensuring their records are available. Go ahead. The Archives Partnership Trust. Um, probably a, one of the most unique and special organizations. It's a public-private partnership established by the state legislature uh, to support the program services and preservation activities at the state archives. Because it's a charity, we're able to accept private donations and philanthropy. And then there's a board of trustees that runs it. They oversee the endowment, which is about $6 million, and the program operations of the trust. 
we raise a few hundred thousand dollars a year um, uh, just in private philanthropy and another couple hundred thousand in grants. Go ahead. One of the things that the trust does, and I think this is an incredibly valuable resource, is online resources for teachers and students are considered the Source New York program. Uh, if we can go ahead one more, Becky. Provides all kinds of resources, activities, documents, uh, resources for teachers to enable teachers and students to use primary sources in the classroom. This database that we have started off with a kernel of resources that we had built at the State Archives, but now it is really being built by teachers across the state who are adding content to this resource and making it basically a tool from teachers for teachers about primary sources. Uh, we've got a wonderful uh, support from IMLS to enable us to move this resource forward uh, significantly. That's it, I think. That's my last slide. Well, last thing, okay. State Archives Partnership Trust publishes a quarterly magazine, New York Archives, and we have a lot of great programs, including one on Tuesday, November 1st, which will be available streaming for a small fee. Uh, you too can hear a great conversation with Lonnie Bunch, the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, who's going to talk about his experiences working in our field. Now, I believe I am done. Well, I'll stop. So Becky, you can go through all those. Uh, you'll see all the slides if you look at it later to find out how to learn more about us. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. And thank you, Joe and, and Ronnie as well. There's a lot of, a lot of great things going on at these uh, state archives, New York and New Jersey. Um, wonderful collections as expected um, and a lot of great initiatives and programs in place. Uh, are there any questions? I'm not seeing anything in chat at the moment. Does anybody have any questions for any of the speakers? Um, while, while we're waiting for you all to tippy tap into the chat, your questions, um, I've, I've got one for um, either New York or New Jersey or both, um, if, if you can answer briefly. Um, it, it's certainly something that's on our minds a lot. Um, we know that that government archives has a have a long history of being eyed with some suspicion, either because uh, people have some legitimate concerns about trusting government, or uh, or because perhaps they have less concrete uh, concerns. Um, do you do you find that suspicion has heightened? In light of recent events, with archives being in the news, or just a generally um, highly politicized atmosphere, have you had to make any adjust adjustments to how you operate or engage with or communicate with the public? We haven't seen anything. Uh, I don't think that uh, has caused us to make any changes in how we are dealing with the public. But we would certainly welcome archives being more in the spotlight. <laughs> it, you know, uh, transitions of governors are always a challenge with, you know, with us and, and, uh, you know, we want to make sure that records are preserved. And same with us in New York. In fact, we're getting more out of voice. We're glad that you're here to promote transparency and ensure that the people's resources are protected. I think some of that goes to our marketing and communication about what the state archives is and does. Uh, these are you know, our bottom line message to the public is these are your records from your public servants. Therefore, okay. they, you are entitled to access and our job is to make sure that you both have them and have a means of getting access to them. Yes, that's great. That's great. Thank you, uh, Joe and, and Ronnie and Tom. Thanks for your, your insight and your information. Um, if anybody else has any questions, I don't see any. Uh, if you type them in while Becky wrap things up, and uh, if you finish typing before we finish, then uh, we'll get to your questions. Thank you, Becky. All right. Thanks, Beth. Thanks to all our speakers and everybody for attending. We do have um, one more thing coming up in November. We are done with our webinar series. This is the last one, but next month we will be um, pushing out our next In Conversation With video. And it's a really great one. So watch for that coming out. And there are a couple, there's one more Siri webinar coming up next month on the DPC MM assessment. Um, if you've been following along with that or want to start following along, 
go ahead and register for that. And we do have a couple more Shop Talk webinars coming up, one November 10th with Preservica and one December 1st with Family Search. Both are at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can register for both of those on our website as well. Um, these are actually really great webinars. They are not sales pitches, so do not be afraid of that. Um, it's a really great, interesting way to see what some of our sponsors are up to. And as always, you can contact us, follow us. We're all over the place. And we have to thank our sponsors and funders because without them, we cannot do a lot of what we do. So thank you to all of our sponsors and funders. And last but not least, please, please, please fill out the evaluation form that you will be directed to. We really do want your feedback. And the planning committee is currently working on next year's webinar schedule. So we would love to have your feedback. If you have ideas of things you want to see for future webinars, please let us know. And that is it. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.